Tonight, Dr. Emerson will be giving her lecture titled, Excavating the Margins of Pompeii. Now let's go ahead and give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest and tonight's women speaker, Dr. Allison. Thank you all. Thank you for being here tonight. Can everyone hear me okay? Is this a good distance? All right. Well, thank you to Dr. Benicio for that kind introduction. Um, to the entire Department of Earth and Environmental Systems who have been amazing hosts and coordinated a really fantastic visit in the past few days. Um, and especially thank you to Laura and Jim and to the Whitman family. I'm just delighted and honored to be this year's Whitman speaker. The Roman city of Pompeii holds a special place in the public imagination. The catastrophic eruption of the volcano Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE created an unparalleled archaeological site, which allows millions of visitors annually to stroll through the monument of the Forum, marvel at the lofty halls of elite houses, and even come face to face with the plaster casts of Vesuvius's victims. Recently renewed clearance of the volcanic material that still covers a third of the ancient city has revealed incredible finds from delicately painted walls and elaborate mosaic floors to small but spectacular objects like this box containing over two dozen magical amulets to the first ever recovered Roman chariot made of bronze, iron, and wood and decorated with inset panels of erotic scenes. And the ash from the eruption even preserved on this chariot a garland of flowers hung across it in a sheaf of grain left sitting on its seat. These are obviously amazing finds. But there is another side of Pompeii. In fact, much of the city is dominated by small and often heavily degraded structures, which have tended to receive less attention both from researchers and from casual visitors. It's precisely these spaces that interest me. Pompeii's less immediately impressive ruins provide unprecedented opportunity to reconstruct ancient urban life and in particular to reconstruct the lives of the city's majority, those residents who were not part of the socioeconomic elite. Many such buildings are found on the edges of the city, that is, on its physical margins, while the people who once lived and worked in them were often individuals who were enslaved, formerly enslaved, or free but with limited resources, and include men and women alike. So these are people who live on the figurative margins of the city as well. I consider my work, therefore, an archaeology of the margins, since I seek to discover new understandings of how Roman cities function, both from the bottom up and the outside in, as well as to illuminate the lives of individuals who have been marginalized, both in their ancient experiences and in modern approaches to the ancient past. Today, I'd like to focus on what's currently the central aspect of my work, a new excavation of one of Pompeii's many overlooked and understudied buildings. The Pompeii 114 project is an international excavation headed by Tulane University and the Parco Archaeologico di Pompeii with Indiana State University and ISU's Geospatial and Virtual Archaeology Laboratory and Studio, counted among our chief collaborators. So I am especially excited to be sharing these results here. Region 1, City Block 14, is located in the eastern part of Pompeii along a central road running from the city's southeastern gate, the Porta Nocera. Our research focuses on the southern side of the block, and in particular on a large building access through the entrances today labeled Doorway 1 and Doorways 11 through 13. So that's the building framed with a slightly darker black line in the image here. Like many other buildings in this part of the city, a substantial portion of its interior space was given over to a large garden here in green. And its layout at the time of the eruption suggests it might have cobbled together several earlier structures. While its easternmost area shares a common entranceway plan with many small houses in Pompeii, the rest of the building does not suggest domestic space. In fact, it features no fewer than nine interior rooms whose dimensions, decorations, and fixtures suggest that they serve primarily for dining. Four of these opened onto a portico overlooking the garden. 
and another five were part of a particularly unusual suite in the northeastern northeastern corner of the building. In the garden itself, a three-sided bench indicates additional outdoor dining space. Such benches, which were called triquinia in Latin, were used for the dinner parties of the Roman elite, who dined reclining. This example provided space for nine to twelve people to recline. The rest of the building was occupied by two large shops, indicated by their wide doorways that opened onto the road south of the block, while a staircase with a latrine below provided access from a central corridor to a now lost upper story. The Garden Triclinium is not the only structure that suggests elite style dining in this building. In fact, nearly all of the rooms were sized and scaled to hold arrangements of dining couches for parties of various sizes from intimate gatherings of just a few people to large groups of 20 or more. Like the dining rooms of elite mansions, the walls of these rooms were painted, and those off the portico, which are our best preserved examples, had simple mosaic floors. This was clearly not, however, an elite home. In fact, the building's layout suggests nothing more than a restaurant, offering sit-down, or maybe we should say better for the Roman context, lie-down meals to diners. Restaurants are well known from Pompeii. Over 160 examples of so-called fast food style restaurants have been located here. They tend to stand along busy thoroughfares and at intersections where they're easy to identify by the fixed masonry counters from which patrons can carry away prepared food. Some such buildings, which are often called bars or taverns in modern scholarship, incorporated additional back rooms typically conceived as places where patrons could sit to enjoy food, drink, a game of dice, or even an erotic encounter, as depicted in these scenes from a wall painting found in the back room of a fast food style bar in Region 6 at Pompeii. Such businesses had unsavory reputations among the Roman elite who leave most of our literary record for the period. Those who could afford to do so dined at home, or the homes of friends and acquaintances, where they were waited on by enslaved chefs and fed de or waited on, excuse me, by enslaved servers and fed delicacies created by enslaved chefs. Eating out for the Romans was a distinctly lower class activity, a necessity for those who lived in cramped quarters and upstairs apartments, who lacked the space for cooking and entertaining, as well as the resources to enslave specialty chefs or buy expensive and flavorful ingredients. The many fast food restaurants in Pompeii, therefore, have been interpreted as simple as serving simple and repetitive menus of cheap foodstuffs to the city's poorest residents, who had no other option than to eat out. The building we're studying on the southern side of Block 114 clearly did not belong to the fast food restaurant type. It was, however, closely linked to one such structure, which stood on the southeastern corner of the block. The fast food bar at entrance 15 incorporated six back rooms, placing it among the largest examples in the city. Notably, these two restaurants on the southern side of Block 114 had once been interconnected through a smaller building between them that featured a large kitchen at the time of the eruption. Although the doorways that provided access between the buildings had been blocked sometime prior to 79, the sit-down restaurant did not feature a kitchen in its final phase suggesting that all three structures might have continued to operate as a unit, even without intercommunication. To explore the history and use of these buildings, as well as the lives of those who lived in, worked in, and patronized them, our primary method is subsurface excavation. The buildings of Block 114 were cleared of volcanic material from the eruption of Vesuvius, first in the 1950s and fully in the 1990s. We begin where those interventions ended, approximately at the floor level of 79 CE, and continue our excavations below the floors, through all the phases of Pompeii's human history. We extend targeted excavations from individual rooms to the whole of Block 114 by incorporating an architectural survey that reconstructs the interconnected chronology of all standing walls, tying them to the subsurface chronology via the architecture that touches trenches. Our artifactual study includes ceramics, small finds, and environmental teams, and we leverage new technologies to collect and analyze our data. 
most notably through an integrated geodatabase that allows us to situate all project data within an online three-dimensional surrogate of the site. And this is the side of the project led by Dr. Benigio and his team of ISU faculty, students, and alumni. We completed our first season of excavation last summer in 2022, and we'll continue to excavate in the area for at least two more years. We currently concentrate on four chief research questions, which I'll present here in sequence. Now, please keep in mind that these results are extremely preliminary, and we expect to further refine them in the coming years of work. Nevertheless, even this one brief season of excavation has already begun to reveal new understandings of Roman lives. Our first research question is a simple one. What can the excavation of Block 114 tell us about the pre-eruption history and urban development of Pompeii? While well, Pompeii represents the longest running archeological excavation in the world, there has been continuous systematic study of the site since 1748. The vast majority of that work has focused on clearance of the volcanic deposits left by Vesuvius and very little true archeological excavation, that is subsurface stratigraphic examination of cultural levels created by human activity has yet been done at Pompeii. That's only really become popular since the 1990s, and at this point we can estimate that maybe 5 to 10 percent of the city has been excavated versus the two-thirds of the city that has been cleared of the volcanic material. As a result, the many centuries of Pompeii's life before the eruption still remain little understood. In digging below the floor surfaces of the final phase, we aim to add valuable data to an emerging picture of the pre-Roman and even prehistoric city. Even prior to beginning our work, the natural topography of the site suggested that we might recover early finds in Block 114. Pompeii is located on a high plateau of solid lava, which resulted from a prehistoric eruption flow. The southwestern side of the city sits above a steep cliff, below which was a swampy landscape that gave way to the sea coast, an antiquity located about a kilometer away. Today, continuing volcanic activity has moved it about another kilometer past that. To the southeast of Pompeii was higher ground, leading towards the Sarno River, which was one of the region's chief natural resources. The topography suggests that any prehistoric traffic through the area, predating later interventions to develop the swamps to the southwest, was most likely to pass through the southeast. Near a natural access point to the plateau, located at or near the later southeastern city gate. Being located just inside that gate, Block 114 provides the opportunity to capture evidence for any such activity. In our first season, we were able to access undisturbed prehistoric soil levels in only one small sondage on the northern side of the later restaurant. In the other areas excavated, later ancient activity had removed all traces of such early stratigraphy. Within this sondage, however, we recovered several handmade ceramic shirts of the type known as impasto wear. These typically date to the Italian Bronze Age, roughly the 12th to 10th centuries BCE. The shards, furthermore, were sealed below volcanic deposits of an eruption of Vesuvius that predates the 9th century BCE, confirming their early chronology. Although this picture remains extremely fragmentary, to say the least, this sondage confirms that we're on the right track in pursuing Pompeii's earliest archaeology and helps justify laying out later trenches to expressly target such material. The next phases of activity in Block 114 were likewise indicated only by ephemeral remains, but promised more to be found in subsequent excavation seasons. At some early date, a building was located in the southwestern area of the later block. Its walls were indicated only by rock and trenches, that is, by later cuts made into the soil to remove the architecture that had once been in place there. Although the walls themselves are missing, the cuts give us valuable information about them. First, these early walls followed the same alignment as the standing building, indicating that Pompeii's final shape reflected an urban form that had begun developing many centuries before. The size of the robbing trenches suggests that the removed walls had belonged to a type known from other subsurface excavations of Pompeii, which represent the earliest known architecture at the site. Such walls, or maybe better, wall foundations, are in a soft volcanic stone known as Papamante, which was easy to work but lacked durability, and so was utilized only for a brief period of Pompeii's history. 
Papamonte foundations have been recovered from various areas of the site. Typically, they were set in shallow foundation trenches, and in nearly all cases were preserved as only one course. They most likely supported other walls and more ephemeral materials like wood or mud above. Notably, we did uncover one Papamonte block in our 2022 season, but this was not part of a foundation. <laughs> Instead, the block had been flipped on end and set inside a pit along with another stone. And this pit really looks like it was dug expressly for this purpose. The odd arrangement suggests ritual practice, probably upon the dismantlement of the original building in the area. And such activities have been attested, although admittedly not in precisely this form, in other areas of the city. Although we have no datable material to associate either with the construction or the de destruction of our rock walls, Buildings with Papamonte foundations typically date to the 6th century BCE. Often these were dismantled and their materials were used in walls of the 4th century. Like our missing walls, in almost all cases, these early Papamonte remains were aligned with the final buildings of the ancient city. Once the earliest walls had been dismantled, a packed earth road ran through the southwestern area of the site, mostly paralleling the final road that framed the western side of the block and likely representing a slightly wider or slightly offset earlier version. Again, we see here the original outline of a civic infrastructure that would remain in place until the eruption, with a version of the street grid that in this case can be placed in the 3rd or 2nd century BCE. This road was in use over a long period. It was repaved multiple times with new layers of hard packed earth. In several instances, these were set on, on beds of broken ceramic shirts. A stone curb might have separated the road from an open area to the east, and several cesspits were added here in the later second and early first centuries, apparently reflecting increasing activity in the zone prior to the construction of the final building. In general, these cesspits contain standard domestic assemblages, but one held interesting deposits of ash and clay, and note that clay was not a naturally occurring soil type at Pompeii, so must have been imported. Other finds from within this cesspit suggested industrial activity in the area, possibly including ceramics manufacturing. A pottery workshop of the same period has been recovered to the west, just inside the gate known as the Port of Stavia, and the only ceramics workshop still operating inside the walls at the time of the eruption was located just south of our building in Block 114. The cesspit, therefore, could be part of a long tradition of ceramics manufacture across the southern side of the building. Our first season of excavation made clear that at least the western area of the restaurant was significantly later than traditional interpretations have assumed based on its standing architecture. A blocked doorway, which I'll highlight here, on the southern facade gave rise to the idea that the building originally had been a series of row houses, dating as early as the 3rd century BCE and later combined to make the final structure. We can now be sure that that was not the case. Instead, the western area of the building arose in the second half of the first century BCE, so significantly later than has been assumed. And this block doorway represents a postern door that originally led into an open garden. From the early first century CE, the building had much the same plan it would maintain until the eruption, possibly indicating that it functioned for commercial dining already in that period. A well-appointed kitchen located on the northern side of the property as well as the many dining rooms that had already been installed by this time, supports that conclusion. The kitchen would be dismantled and replaced with another dining room prior to the eruption, possibly at the same time that access was cut off between the restaurant, the building next door, and the bar on the corner. In the mid-first century, however, it featured a cooking bench, so the Roman version of your oven and stove, a cesspit, and a sluice drain for liquids the last of which was sized to be appropriate for the cleaning and refilling of the large wine and trans wine transport and storage vessels known as amphorae. And this feature strongly suggests that the kitchen was therefore serving a commercial rather than domestic purpose. The kitchen cesspit, as well as the others recovered across the site, provides a good segue into our second research question, which relates to urban infrastructure, and in particular to waste management at Pompeii. We seek to understand how residents dealt with urban refuse, a central question of my own research for quite a few years now. Traditional studies of the subject have focused the question on sanitation, debating whether Romans managed their waste 
and so enjoyed clean and sanitary cities, or ignored it, and so suffered from filth and disease. In past work, I've sought to bridge this dichotomy, proposing a Roman system that both carefully managed waste and guaranteed its presence in daily life. Pompeii was, undeniably by our standards, a trashy city. Inside buildings, waste often was corralled in cesspits or other areas, but the one that we excavated in the mid-first century CE kitchen is going to provide our best example of the type. The upper structure had been destroyed when the kitchen was remodeled into a dining room, but it likely had originally held a latrine above. The connection of kitchen and latrine, or toilet, if you want to put it another way, is well attested at Pompeii. Roman flush toilets operated a bit differently than what we might be used to. A typical example featured a wooden or terracotta seat on stone struts. A sloping plaster or tile floor allowed the toilet to be flushed with a bucket of water into the cesspit below. The example on the screen from a building next door to the restaurant is missing its seat, but has the added amenity of a reused amphora between the stone struts to help corral waste. Although we might feel a bit squeamish to the, at the idea, to the Romans, latrines were ideally placed in kitchens. And of course, we should remember here that they didn't have germ theory. Kitchens generated more trash than any other area of the house, and the latrine allowed for easy disposal of general garbage as well as human waste. Cooking ashes dumped inside could have helped to tamp down smells, although this was probably less effective than we might hope. Most importantly for the Romans, kitchens, whether in commercial or domestic contexts, were most often populated by the enslaved residents of the city, who were also most likely to use fixed latrines. If given the option, and someone else to empty them, Romans seem to prefer chamber pots to toilets. Latrines and kitchens, therefore, fit together within the Roman concept of service spaces versus display areas of a building. If we examine the restaurant's kitchen cesspit, we might notice another aspect of such fixtures that can strike us as a bit disturbing. This pit is not very deep. In fact, it opened less than two meters below the floor of the room, providing very little separation between those cooking above and the waste in the cesspit. This shallowness is not unusual for Pompeii, where cesspits were regularly cleaned. That is, their contents were removed and deposited elsewhere. This leads towards what fascinates me most about Pompeii's trash. Earlier, I called Pompeii a trashy city, but that description is actually pretty unfair because the Pompeians were excellent recyclers. By the first century CE, the city generated massive quantities of garbage, but it also consumed that material through a large-scale system of reuse and recycling. To understand this system, we should look outside our restaurant, and even outside the city center, to the districts just beyond Pompeii's fortification wall. Already in the 18th century, excavators had identified deposits of what could only be urban trash outside the wall. This is what we're looking at now. The lower, darker deposit is a pile of ancient refuse emerging from below the lighter colored volcanic material from the eruption. Such deposits contain mounds of mixed up, undifferentiated materials, primarily ceramic shirts and bits of glass, metal, and animal bone, all set within a sandy, ashy soil matrix. Beyond small pieces of mortar and plaster, building materials were rare, as were larger objects in general. The finds within the mounds were almost entirely small and often very heavily worn. These suggest, therefore, that larger and more useful discarded objects had been removed for recycling, a process well attested in both literary and archaeological evidence. The Romans melted down and reformed glass and metal, carved larger bones into new objects, and reused ceramics in an almost countless variety of processes, whether grinding down old pots to make temper for manufacturing, cutting them up to become stoppers or funnels for other vessels, incorporating them into hydraulic systems, whole or in parts, or even using them as caskets for infants and small children, which was a sadly common function, especially for the large transport amphorae. The leftover garbage deposits, from which immediately useful objects had been removed, stood on all sides of Pompeii, mixed among the monumental tombs that dominated much of the extramural area, in keeping with Roman laws that restricted the debt from the city center. 
Here we see a collection of tombs outside Pompeii's northern gate, the ports of Vesuvio, behind which is a huge pile of garbage. That's again the darker material below the light volcanic ash. In this case, the pile is just about as tall as the tombs, and so must be at least five meters, a good 15 feet tall. These waste mounds are so large and so prevalent that in the 20th century, a popular theory claimed Pompeii's tombs had been abandoned following a major earthquake in 62 or 63 CE, at which point the elites who built the tombs fled the city, leaving it to their former slaves and the urban poor. We can now firmly reject that theory, which even a cursory study shows to be false. But in more recent years, the combination of tombs and trash outside Pompeii's walls has influenced a general reading of these areas as a sort of no man's land, a dark or dangerous inverse of the city within the wall, given over to garbage and the dead. The mounds outside Pompeii were not, however, landfills in the modern sense. That is, places where waste was removed and permanently stored away from daily life. In fact, much of this waste ended up back where it had begun, inside the city, and in many cases, literally inside its walls. The Roman construction industry incorporated huge amounts of reused materials. Within the concrete walls of Pompeii, which would have been covered with layers of decorative plaster, stones are often well-worn and sometimes feature several layers of mortar indicating that they had been part of multiple walls and reused when those were knocked down or moved. Roman law assumes the value of such materials, and there was an extensive body of legislation concerning them. For example, a prohibition on allowing buildings to fall into disrepair in order to recover their materials, or a law that granted all building materials to your neighbor if your wall accidentally fell on their property. At Pompeii, low-quality walls could incorporate broken tiles, bricks, chunks of concrete flooring, and even mixed refuse like parts of ceramic vessels. As for the reused stones, some of these preserve traces of mortar and plaster that indicate they had been part of earlier structures as well. The walls suggest one place that Pompeii's trash could end up. To return to the so-called leftover mounds, these were arguably the most reused objects in Pompeii, at least if we're counting by volume. This is because the city's construction industry incorporated extensive fills. Such fills could be divided into two types, feature fills and floor fills, both of which were essential to phases of reconstruction. Feature fills closed voids, such as the two phases of fish salting tanks seen in the photo on the left-hand side of the screen taking them out of use and allowing new packed earth surfaces to be laid above. Floor fills, on the other hand, covered earlier floors and provided solid foundations for new one. These fills make up the vast majority of all cultural deposits at Pompeii. While it's still too soon to make any statistical analyses of the deposits in Block 114, my last excavation, which Dr. Bajijo referred to earlier at the Port of Stavia, opened 30 trenches over a 4,000 square meter neighborhood inside the Port of Stavia, and found that 93% of all excavated contexts were fills. And continuous reconstruction of these buildings required absolutely massive quantities of this material. For example, in the mid-first century CE, one building of around 300 square meters was completely reconstructed and its floor raised by 30 centimeters. This effort would have required about 70 cubic meters of fill, that is, let's put it in context, 70,000 wheelbarrow loads and about 120 cubic tons. Clearly, these fills were not collected on site. This wasn't, for example, garbage generated within the building, stored and reused in the same area, and their composition suggests their origin. Pompeii's fills contained mixed up, undifferentiated materials primarily ceramic shards and bits of glass, metal, and animal bone, all heavily worn and set within a sandy, ashy soil matrix. The fills, that is, are identical to the mounds outside the city, from which they almost certainly derive. In short, Pompeii seems to have had a system in which immediately useful objects were stripped from garbage and leftover waste gathered in mounds outside the walls before being recovered for use in construction projects. Rather than landfills and abandoned districts, the mounds represent the incorporation of the zone outside the walls into urban life and imply a regular flow of traffic and activity between the extramural and intramural areas. 
let's get back to the restaurant in 114. In theorizing the system I've just described, archaeologists, including myself and my close colleagues, have relied primarily on data from excavations that did not focus on waste management infrastructure. The current project provides the opportunity to test, refine, and expand the model. By targeting garbage collected inside cesspits and other primary disposal sites, as well as in all phases of secondary reuse within construction fills, we can understand whether certain types of objects were discarded in standard ways, recycled at standard points in the waste cycle, or more likely to move through many phases of use and reuse. We likewise seek to consider the waste system's economic, social, and hygienic impacts, highlighting both the benefits and the drawbacks of life in a city where recycling and reuse were prioritized over waste removal. The Pompeians were far better recyclers than we are, but the trade-off was that they lived in close proximity to their garbage. Pompeii's trash, therefore, seems to have been both carefully managed and ubiquitous. Thinking along these lines leads us to our third and arguably most essential question. What can our excavation tell us about life in Pompeii, particularly among the non-elite? Given that the Romans assumed commercial spaces were also inhabited, generally if not exclusively by those who worked there, we can consider three primary groups in pursuing this question. Those who lived in, those who worked in, and those who patronized the restaurant and other businesses surrounding it. And of course, we can assume overlap between those three categories. Upon the 1950s clearance of the block, three election posters decorated the southern side of the restaurant. In one, two men, Suchessus and Papilio, asked passers-by to elect Lucius Caius Secundus to the office of Duomir, that is, co-mayor of Pompeii, the highest local political position. The other two posters were both sponsored by a man called Equitus. One specifies that Equitus and his household support Gnaeus Helvius Sabinus for Aedile, a junior office tasked with overseeing civic infrastructure. In the other poster, Equitus asks for the election of the same Helvius Sabinus as Aedile, with Lucius Caius Secundus as dual leader. And if you remember, this is the same guy supported by Suchessus and Papilio, so all three posters seem to refer to the same election season in the years immediately leading up to the eruption. An additional poster was found on the same facade to the east of these. In this one, a woman, Tegeticula, supported someone called only Rufus for dual wear. And whether this Rufus was running against Lucius Caius Secundus or in a different year, we don't know. We don't have enough info from the posters to tell us. The names of the individuals who sponsored these posters strongly suggest that they were enslaved, or had once been. The woman, Tegeticula, might have been an enslaved sex worker. Her name means little mattress, and disturbingly, similar punning names are attested for enslaved sex workers in other contexts of Pompeii. Certainly in her case, and possibly for the men as well, the posters indicate participation in a political system by individuals who are officially excluded from it. The massive group of disenfranchised residents at Pompeii, that is, residents who couldn't legally vote, included enslaved men and formerly enslaved men who had not been freed by the legal process that guaranteed citizenship, as well as all women. The posters indicate a reality that can be easily lost when we restrict ourselves to elite sources or top-down viewpoints. Now, whether we can tie any of these individuals to the building is a slightly more difficult question. Pompeii's election posters have been used to assign owners to the properties on which they're found, but such work has rarely risen above speculation. Any of the named supporters here, Suchessus, Papilio, Equitas, and or Tegeticula, might have been connected to the restaurant, as might, for that matter, any of the named candidates, although we could probably assume different roles for the two groups. Alternately, the posters might have been left here for other reasons, which remain, at least to this point, impossible for us to recover. For these reasons, we're on firmer ground reconstructing life within the restaurant through its archaeological deposits. Of course, much of the archaeology here was dominated by construction fills, which, as we've already discussed, almost certainly derived from the mixed up garbage mounds outside the wall, and the contents of which cannot reflect activity in the building itself. Two types of deposits have proven more useful to this question. The remains within cesspits and the objects recovered from ritual context provide direct, primary evidence for activity within the restaurant. To begin with the ritual deposits, we recovered at least half a dozen such contexts in our first season. 
most of which appear to have reflected activities accompanying reconstructions of the building, and so probably were dedicated to the local gods who oversaw the structure or the land on which it stood. Most consisted of simple pits cut alongside dismantled or newly erected walls. These contained food remains burned and deposited whole, and so clearly not related to standard cooking and dining practices. In some cases, other small objects have been left along with the food, such as glass gaming pieces or small ceramics. One deposit of this type was made at the time the suite of rooms was added to the northern side of this building likely in the later 1st century BCE or early 1st century CE. Prior to the installation of the floor of the phase, a shallow pit was cut into the center of the central room. On its bottom, worshippers placed an oak board covered in food. Both the board and food had been fully burned and carbonized outside the pit. The food items placed on the board were small and round. You can see a few of them in the image, although most have been removed by this point. They appear to be something like figs, but our preliminary analysis shows that they did not have seeds and so are not fruits. They might be cakes or even little cheeses, so maybe even the gods were in on the charcuterie trend. <laughs> we'll know more after we can do a full examination this coming season, but it's clear that someone here has left a special meal for the gods of this area. <clears throat> Another unusual find that seems likely to have been ritual in nature came from the room in the southwestern corner of the property. Here, just below the floor of the early first century CE, we recovered a gold aureus, the most valuable coin in the Roman monetary system, and not a common find in the subsurface archaeology of Pompeii. This example was minted by Rome's first emperor, Augustus, in the last year of his life, which places it in 13 or the beginning of 14 CE. Coins recovered in the urban archaeological layers of Pompeii often are conceived as lost objects, overlooked and trampled into dirt floors. Most examples, however, are not in the floors, which we should note are really quite hard and difficult to trample anything into. Instead, they're below the floors, in the floor fills that provide their foundations. Recovered coins are almost always small and heavily worn bronze issues, that is the lowest value in the monetary system, and many are early types that had been entirely devalued when Pompeii officially became a Roman colony in the first century BCE. Some of these might have been lost and overlooked in the garbage, eventually coming to be part of floor fills, but others might simply have been regarded as worthless and so thrown away. It's hard to believe, though, that this arius was either lost or thrown away. The coin represents more than a month's work or a month's salary for an average worker. Given its location just under the hard-packed floor, at the very top of the subfloor fill, it appears to have been placed intentionally as an unusually valuable votive offering. Given the commercial nature of the building in this period, it's possible that whoever left the arius hoped that its deposition would generate even more riches. The arius was an unexpected and certainly a typical find. But even some objects discarded in cesspits were more valuable than we had anticipated. For example, the refuse within the kitchen cesspit we examined earlier was dominated by predictable finds of simple cooking and, and dining wares, but also included a rare lead glazed cup with a gold gilded edge. This cup's twin is part of the Roman collection at the Met. The cesspit contained fragments of other lead glazed wares as well representing a step above the mass-produced ceramic dishes that are most common across Pompeii. Furthermore, the foods within the cesspit, while still under examination, suggest a varied and flavorful diet that included meat, fruit, and seafood. Although the literary sources might give the impression of two dining classes at Pompeii, the elites with their elaborate dinner parties and the masses consuming gruel on a street corner, this building suggests a reality between the two, a luxury light, or maybe we should say luxury light, uh, version, a dining experience for those who could afford to treat themselves, even if they lacked the resources for at-home entertaining. The restaurant's decoration indicates the same. Its painted walls and mosaic floors definitely can't be placed among the highest quality examples from the city, but they do give the impression of elite-style dining. The garden likewise preserved an impression of elite space. Careful analysis of the garden bed allowed us to reconstruct its plantings at the time of the eruption, which were decidedly simple, 
limited to a few grapevines trained over a pergola that shaded the dining bench, and one small tree or bush planted to the north. This southern area of the garden, at least, was neither particularly productive nor intensively cultivated. This contrasted with the gardens of elite homes, where enslaved gardeners nurtured unexpected combinations of species, echoing a Roman interest in subduing the natural world. The garden here, in contrast, seems to fulfill the idea of a domestic garden, right down to an altar placed opposite the dining bench that, we should note, had absolutely zero traces of any ritual activity surrounding it, and so never seems to have been used for any practical purpose beyond giving the idea of a sacred garden shrine. As a commercial structure that provided dining in an elite-inspired setting, without precisely replicating elite spaces or modes of use. This restaurant has a few potential parallels within the city walls. Several buildings best interpreted as sit-down restaurants were located to the west, just inside the Porta Stavia, and a few other examples can be found scattered throughout the city, especially on its southern side. One of these is the best-known fast food bar in Pompeii. Famous for the painted shrine on its back wall that featured Mercury, God of Profit, and Bacchus, God of Wine, so a very fitting collection of gods to worship here. Behind the bar room, this building featured both an indoor small dining room and a garden triclinium arranged for reclined parties, suggesting modes of dining out that were similar to those offered on the southern side of Block 114, if far smaller in scale. Other parallels lead us to our fourth and final research question. How was Pompeii's urban development tied to dependent settlements in, in its territory, that is, to its suburbs? My first book focused on Roman suburbs, which are particularly well attested in the territory surrounding Pompeii. Close parallels for the restaurant in 114 come from suburbs south of the city. In antiquity, these areas alongside the river and sea coast, were intimately linked to Pompeii's port, which served all of the cities in its region. Past studies of the port have sought to identify its precise location, and scholarship on Pompeii has yet to grapple with how the city and its port districts interacted, that is, how people lived between them. While the map may give the impression that these districts were far from the city itself, most could be reached from major gates in less than 10 minutes on foot. The suburbs alongside Pompeii's port were dominated by commercial hospitality and restaurants on various scales and at various levels of luxury, from simple fast food bars to elite style and in some cases, extremely well-decorated triclinia. To me, the prevalence of commercial dining within the southern port suburbs, as well as the southern neighborhoods inside the wall, suggests a connection between the two. Scholarship on Pompeii has tended to limit itself to the modern archaeological park as defined by the ancient fortification wall. The areas within remain open and available for study, while most remains outside the ancient city have been destroyed by modern construction, and so are accessible only by historic records of highly varying quality. As a result, those scholars who have noticed the dining-oriented buildings on the southern side of Pompeii have tended to link them to the nearby amphitheater, proposing that such spaces were cultivated market gardens during most of the year, but occasionally used for dining parties during festival periods. Looking outside the walls, however, suggests a different situation. While locals might occasionally have patronized these businesses, the restaurants inside Pompeii's southern gates seem more directly oriented towards travelers originating from the port, who would have passed along the highway south of the city before continuing their journeys to the region's largest inland centers, Nucheria to the east, and Nola to the northeast. Unfortunately, Pompeii's port suburbs are now buried below modern buildings, leaving them fully inaccessible. We therefore aim to explore the dynamic between city and suburb by working within the archaeological park, but with an eye towards a more expansive Pompeian urbanism, recognizing the city as part of a network of other sites near and far, all of which were linked together through their suburbs. To conclude briefly, I'd again like to emphasize the preliminary nature of these conclusions. We're, young, we're one year into a much larger project, and we have really barely touched the surface of our research questions. Nevertheless, this first season of work has prepared us well for the years to follow. We can now confirm Block 114's potential to illuminate not only Pompeii's pre-eruptive or pre-Roman history, 
but to provide evidence for the earliest human activity in the area, dating to a period that is still heavily obscured. The project likewise promises to reveal new evidence for how the city functioned, from its civic infrastructure, including but not limited to waste management, to its broader urbanism within its territory and region. Perhaps most essentially, the Pompeii 114 project is already adding texture to our understanding of the Roman sub elite, helping us move away from simple dichotomies of rich and poor to reconstruct a wide spectrum of ancient urban experience. This coming summer, we aim to expand what's still a keyhole view by excavating new zones of Block 114, focusing on the northern area of the garden, the smaller building between the sit down and fast food restaurants, and the eastern room surrounding entrance one, where the standing architecture appears earliest. This last zone includes a space between the restaurant and the house next door at entrance two. Judging from its architecture, the house is the earliest structure on the entire block, and it underwent many changes through time. The space between the house and the restaurant contained extensive hydraulic infrastructure at the time of the eruption, sharing water and other resources between the two buildings, and possibly indicating links of ownership or other ties that bound them. To better understand those relationships, we hope to reveal this system fully and reconstruct its chronological development. For now, we're continuing to build a foundation of understanding, aiming always to illuminate the edges, uplifting the lives and experiences of those who existed on the margins of Pompeii. Thank you.